Welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Aaron. We have a very special episode with Corey Mazasek of The Athletic joining us fresh from Montreal to talk about the draft and the new GM. So stay tuned. It will be episode number 152. All right. Welcome back. Thanks, Corey, for joining us. Uh, yeah. Thanks again for having me. Yeah. How was uh, Montreal? It was great. Um, it was a very eventful week for the Sharks, but it was, you know, it was like one of the people have been talking about how there haven't been a lot of gatherings like that for the league since the pandemic started, and it was everybody was just kind of happy to see everybody again, and yeah, it was it was it was quite an experience. Yeah, so. I felt like trades were flying because uh, GMs were in the same room together for first time in a long time. Yeah. And then I mean, then the atmosphere was just like in the Bell Center. I think I might have tweeted something to the effect of we should have every draft here or every event here because it was just it was insane it like just it sounded like a playoff game whenever Marty St. Louis was talking before the draft started and then whenever the Canadian sort of surprised everyone mm -hmm. you know with with the first pick it was, it was just the place just like exploded it was like whoa this is so this is what it was like uh, or the, what it is like whenever you're in an arena and it's just it was insane good so, yeah. good energy yeah yeah, I was watching at one point, Gary Bettman came on to announce a trade, and he barely got any booze, which is not normal. And he kind of, you know, hit at the crowd saying, hey, you know, what happened to the energy? And then everyone started to boo, yeah. and he goes, oh, that's better. Yeah. I thought that was pretty funny. Well, then also, they had the, I mean, the, the Canadians were part of the big trade, too, right? Yeah. So there was like, he was like, okay, settle down, settle down, we need, you're going to want to hear this. So yeah. I, uh, every, anytime he goes up there and he has like a really big trade to announce, he gets to kind of this like... You're gonna want to hear this, yeah. like, and he's he's done that before too. So he's yeah. kind of a showman in a way. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. That's good. All right. Well, let's get into it. Um, first off, Mike Greer was hired as the as the next GM of the Sharks. Yep. Um, he's breaking barriers as the first black GM in the league, and I think that's a little bit ridiculous that it took a little over 105 years, I think, yep. of the league existence before uh, we had our first. GM that is black, but uh, here we are in 2022, and it finally happened. So yep. it's great to get the sharks in the history books, I guess, if you will. Yeah, and I mean, it was look just uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, Brett Peterson was hired by the Panthers. He was the first assistant GM in in league history who was a, a person of color. I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, there's been like kind of incremental progress a little bit here and there. Uh, you know, let's say over the past decade or so, but it really does seem like over the last couple of years, and even just just the other day. I mean, like. Mike Greer was hired, and Haley Wickenheiser was promoted, and um, Kate Madigan in New Jersey was promoted. I think maybe it was the next day, but that was just it was like three or four, you know, three or four like kind of landmark hires all in a span of you know twenty four or forty eight hours. So mm -hmm. it's you know it's you know I, I mean Mike is going to he's going to want to be the GM of the Sharks. Yeah. He's it's it is a monumental thing for everyone else who is black or a person of color in the sport of hockey. And it's a big deal for him too. And like, I mean, I'm, he's proud and, and you know, it's it's gonna be, but he's also just, I think it's it's gonna be interesting to, to watch him sort of navigate like being this sort of symbol for a collection of people in hockey, but also the GM of the Sharks, right? Yeah. And so like, and he's got a lot of, Work to do with that, so it's it's going to be an interesting an interesting journey for him for sure. Yeah, they did. Uh, we did. There was a press conference on, uh, last week on I think it was on Monday, um, and people got to ask some questions. So here's a clip of Mike Greer, kind of explaining. Uh, the question was kind of, um, what do you want the Sharks' identity to be, and the kind of the team that you're going to be building, uh, being the new GM. So here's the clip of Mike. Um, tenacious, highly competitive, in your face fast, hard to play against team, I think. That's what you see when you watch the playoffs. That's what win in, wins in this league, and you know that's what we, we hope to be. Well, he's gonna have a lot of work cut out for him, um, you know, kind of navigating the cap and doing all kinds yeah. of different things. And another question, which I don't have a clip for, but uh, he was asked if it was gonna be a full rebuild mode, and he did not. Um, I don't want to say he flat out said no, but he definitely kind of indicated that he wasn't planning on doing a right. full rebuild. That is, I, I feel like, I mean, I've been here since January, and it, that is, I have heard that word <laughs> more than any other word. Uh, it, yeah, it's just, it's, I mean, it's, it's been interesting. Like, it, it is, you can't get from away, very far away from the discourse about the team and, and, where it's going and what should they do and and I get it like I you know I am I am somebody who 
I, I, you know, I, I believe that the teams that do go to the bottom to come back up, I, I think that's a workable strategy and it has worked for a lot of teams. And just saying that, well, it hasn't worked for a couple teams doesn't, it has still worked for a lot of others. So I, I think the one, the one takeaway that I've had from that just from the past few days is like, everybody was just sort of hanging on every word that came after Doug Wilson Sr. stepped down. And it was, whether it was Jonathan Becker or Joe Will talking, it was just every time they did a, a press conference, it was, are you gonna rebuild? What are you, how are, or if you're not gonna rebuild, how are you gonna, how are you gonna win? And so it's, I do think that there was, they were, for the most part, they were pretty intentionally vague about it at times. Uh, Becker, the, at Patrick Marlowe's retirement press conference, mm -hmm. that was the one time where he said, look, we don't want a rebuild. And then he l defined the rebuild as losing on purpose, tearing down the roster for m multiple years and a long process. To me, that left some gray area. Like, could you say, you know, do like a quick one or try or try to convince ownership that, hey, we need to do a little bit of remodeling mm -hmm. and the, the whole like I think I think it was was Becker who said there are a lot of different R words and then Mike Greer at his introductory press conference said there are a lot of different R words um, I just think that since Mike Greer has been in charge over the past few days a lot of the messaging that I feel like that's come from him has been more not necessarily win at all costs do everything that the Sharks can to make the playoffs next season no matter what I don't I don't I think they're either whether it's him and his philosophy or the whole organization sort of getting behind the idea that hey maybe we could roll that back a little bit and not put too much expectation on the fact that this team needs a lot of work even and would need a lot of things to go right next year for it to make the playoffs mm -hmm. so maybe don't put all of the eggs in that basket necessarily and I, I just think that he you know you know, we're going to see what he does, you know, and, and how he sort of navigates all this. Like you mentioned, there's, it's one thing for him to say that he wants to do certain things, but he's got some challenges with the roster, with the cap. Um, just, you know, just, it's just going to be an interesting, uh, you know, just sort of a, how is he going to navigate all these different things? And so I think that just the idea that he's like, I'm not going to rush this. I'm going to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to take as long as we need to get this right. Um, I think that's, it's probably, it might not, it might be, you know, it might not bring the, the immediate results that some people might want next year, but it also might be closer to what the portion of the fan base that says rebuild, 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 it might be closer to what they want, so. I mean, next year, there's a very special person that's going to go first overall. Yeah. Uh, is it Connor Bedard? Connor Bedard, yeah. Connor Bedard, Bedard. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, tripping me up. Um, that's, I think, what a lot of fans are going to be hoping for, that the Sharks are going to be tanking. Now, I was reading about this, and I if the Sharks were to do that, there's going to be several other teams that are also doing that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the fancy, you know, they always have a catchphrase for it. Tank oh, yeah. Or whatever. Crash for Connor. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, something ridiculous. Whatever. But I, I will say that the, the thing that is slightly different about next year's draft, like, um, is that, yes, he is... You know the best prospect since Crosby, McDavid, Matthews. He's in that. He's in that tier, right? Mm -hmm. Can't miss. The other two or three kids that are going to go like two, three, and four are all would probably all have gone number one this year too. Yeah. So like, like uh, let's we can sit here and say, hey, the the Sharks should try to be bad to to get this kid or to get Any the place. Russian kid or to get Adam Fantilli or just whatever. But the fact of the matter is, is that Arizona is and Chicago have both pretty much already declared their intention to be very bad. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be a couple of other teams that are gonna get off the slow starts and are gonna decide, oh, let's, let's go try to get this kid. So, you know, just, just trying to be bad isn't necessarily gonna guarantee you anything. On the other hand, the teams that are like Arizona and Chicago that are just completely, you know, stripping it all down, they know that look, if we get the third pick, we're still getting, you know, a franchise player probably, just maybe not a generational guy so right yeah but. so it'll be it's gonna be interesting to see i think we're gonna see a lot more sellers at deadlines um that more trades kind of involving those players and, and getting rid of stuff especially for salary cap reasons but um just to kind of further tank so i think even if the sharks wanted to do it i don't think it would be reasonable for them to do it it's going to be very difficult because there's going to be so many teams that are going to be doing practically the same thing yeah and they also there are i i did a story on this a 
few weeks ago just trying to like lay out like okay let's say they just came out tomorrow and said we're tearing it all down it it's not a it would not be an easy process for them they have contracts that they can't move if the players won't won't agree to it and so there's i mean chicago's in a similar situation they have their two best their two you know franchise icons have no movement clauses on their contracts and so they said okay we're going to trade everybody else and then we'll see if you want to stay and be on this so i mm-hmm. think that would be probably what would, what would have to happen here too but yeah like i said i think you know i they're there's they're definitely not going into this coming season saying we're going to be bad and yeah. they're definitely not going into the scenes this season saying you know playoffs are bust right. either so i think that's hiring a new gm hiring a new coaching staff has sort of reset everybody you know it's not oh, is bob Boogner coaching for his job is mm-hmm. you know is joe will coaching or uh, you know managing to be the you know can he be the full-time guy moving forward? i think it's kind of a reset a little bit and that's just true. everybody can sort of back off on on all fronts and just yeah. and see where it goes from here yeah. i think that is that is very helpful that i mean helpful not so much for for Bob Bugner to get fired, but his whole staff was let go. So it's kind of a fresh start for both Mike Greer, everyone. There's less distractions of of no offense, but the media always asking, is he coaching for his job or elsewhere? And I was gonna bring this up at the end of the show, but Bugner just got hired as assistant coach in Detroit, so he's landing on his feet. Plus, he had another year. He's getting paid anyway by the Sharks, so it's not like he's you know homeless on the side of the street or anything. <laughs> he's he's landed yeah. on his feet just fine. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, Earlier, before that, Roy Summer was let go as well, or, or moved, I guess, into yeah. a different position. It wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't. He was. He was going to have a different position in the organization, um, but then San Diego called, or the Ducks called, and said, "Hey, do you still yeah. want to be an AHL coach?" And it would appear. I mean, it's not a. It's not official. Right. Official yet, but it's you know it's it's happening. So, uh, you know, unless something weird would happen in the last minute or whatever. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was an interesting one. I mean, he. You know, again, that was sort of uh, the first step in the process of. They, you know, Becker and Will talked about how they had this whole organization-wide, you know, sort of review, and they were trying to figure out like what have what have we been doing right the last twenty years? What are we, what has gone wrong over the past three or four years that mm-hmm. has got us to this point? And so, um, I think they just it just seems like a fresh start is like kind of the thing that they landed on in a whole bunch of different areas, and so um, they I know that like. A lot of people in the organization just have really valued John McCarthy, like from his playing days yeah. to the role that he was just in as like sort of the, you know, kind of the like almost like a one man player development type situation. And so, you know, they looked at it and said, look, we've got a whole, they've got a, I don't know, five, six, eight rookies coming yeah. into the Barracuda <laughs> next year. It's going to, the Barracuda team is going to be very interesting. Yeah. To, I don't know if they're going to be good, but they're going to be Exciting. interesting. Yeah, they're going to, yeah, there are going to be lots of, you know, interesting prospects that people yeah. are going to want to watch. And so, you know, just uh, that was, it just, you know, if you're going to move on from a guy who has, you know, been here forever, that, you know, that yeah. was maybe the right spot to do it. And, you know, and then also good for him that he's, if he still wants to coach, then he should coach. And yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I forgot to mention Paul's not here because he's down in Southern California. Mm. Uh, he's still on the show, don't worry. Yeah. Uh, Paul and I actually are splitting up. Uh, season tickets to the Barracuda next season, so nice, we'll be nice. at a bunch of those games in their new arena that they yeah, are looking forward finishing to right now. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, it'll be exciting. Um, okay, let's move on to the draft now. First thing I was going to bring up is um, Seattle Kraken got so lucky <laughs> with Shane Wright falling into lap fourth overall. It's kind of funny. We're like, wow, you know, Montreal didn't take him. That was a big shock. And then uh, the next couple teams, Arizona, and I forgot who the other team was. Um, who picked second? The Devils overall. picked second. The Devils, yeah. yeah. So the Devils skipped him, and then yeah. I think Arizona freaked out and said we'd already figured we were taking this guy, so let's not take him. Maybe I, I think they also might have just decided that they liked the guy better. I know yeah. I thought I think that happens in the baseball draft sometimes, where guy a guy will start sliding, and there's way more like pre-draft negotiation stuff that happens in baseball. But I think in I think they just Arizona had their list, and they I mean there were there were definitely people that. Liked Logan Cooley a lot, so yeah. you know we'll, we'll see how that how that goes. But yeah, the only reason I'm really bringing it up is because Seattle now mm-hmm. has uh, I'm gonna screw up his name Beniers Ben Beniers Beniers yeah Beniers uh, <laughs> Beniers is their first overall or first center, and then they're gonna have Shane Wright is like yeah. uh, to me there's a huge pressure coming off of him instead of going to a team to be the yeah. number one guy. Now he's going to be the number two guy and see a little bit less of the top competition. I think he's going to get brought in 
maybe not this upcoming year, maybe he'll, he'll you know get shelter a little bit more, but in the next two, three, four years and for a long time, their number one and number two centers are gonna be very dominant and very strong and the Sharks are gonna see a lot of them. Yeah, you know, I I mean, Shane Wright was, it's, he was one of those guys like that you hear about when, I mean, cause he, well, he had exceptional status into the mm -hmm. OHL, so he, he played in the OHL a year earlier than every other, most other kids do. And so, like when he was 15, 16 years old, it was, he's the number one pick in this draft, it's mm -hmm. in this class, it's it's an easy choice. And then he just, he was good, not really good this year. And this this year, like the year leading up to the draft year is, you know, there are some there are some kids who, you know, figure it out and blossom when they're 15 or 16 years old, and then there are other kids who do it at 17, and then there are other kids who do it at 20. But like, I think a couple of the other kids just really came on I mean, I think the, the Slovakian kids that went first and second, they really had like a big push finish mm -hmm. at the end, like getting to play the international games that they did. And so, yeah, we'll see. I don't, I mean, it, there have been guys like that who have been, hey, this guy's going to be the number one pick for three years in his draft class. Like Jack Hughes was like that, yeah. you know, McDavid. Um, and then they just, they end up doing it. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it, yeah, you're right. I mean, if he ends up being what people thought he was going to be a year ago, or 18 months ago, then yeah, they could they could very well have like a you know Crosby Malkin yeah. or you know name your you know just name these teams that have had like these kind of two monster centers that that's what Kraken could have in mm -hmm. a few years. So. Yeah, not good for the Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> not good for Sharks fans, I should say. Um, okay, so moving on to the Sharks. The Sharks had the 11th overall pick. Uh, to me, it looked like they hey, they ended up uh, trading this pick down with Arizona and taking uh, two second rounders and their late first round pick that Arizona had the rights to. So um, to me, it seemed like the Sharks were targeting a guy who, in the first top 10 before they could pick. That person was taken and they had this uh, trade ready to go in case that person was picked. Because it, it And this was Greer's first trade as a GM. So he was working it and did a great job. So I think to me, before I get your answer, I think it's great because uh, they end up getting three guys in the top 50 versus one guy that would have been 11th overall, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like the Shark Scouts, I think they had mentioned that f basically picks 10 through 50 were like in the same kind of tier of players. So they kind of were mixed around. Uh, they didn't really care as, you know, they don't really care where the overall is. They, they're getting more, more guys, more prospects coming in that would be better than having one prospect that could be a miss at 11th yeah. overall. So what do you think about the trade and what the picks that they got from it? Well, so yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think they, I mean, Mike Greer basically alluded to the idea that they had, whether it was one guy or two guys or three guys even, um, you know, they set their board. Every team sets their board and none of the board, none of their lists look the same and mm -hmm. most of them don't look like the <laughs> ones that we see before the draft. So. Uh, yeah, so, you know, like they had guys, they were, a team that picks 11th is never, almost never picks the 11th player on their on their list. They were looking at probably at guys like five, six, seven or something like that. And so those guys, you can kind of look at the list and say, well, they probably liked Kevin Korczynski and they probably liked Marco Casper. And, they, and so um, they mentioned that um, there had been some chatter with other teams, some discussions with other teams about what they might do at 11 before Mike Greer was hired. So they kind of had an idea of some teams that were interested in maybe, and you could look look at the teams that did it. You know, Chicago mm -hmm. was very Death. aggressive in moving yeah. up, and Arizona was very aggressive in moving up. So you can probably surmise that they picked about, talked to both of those teams and said, look, if, if our guy's not there at 11, what would you give us for this? And so the thing that Greer had to do was he basically, you know, had to like make the decision in the heat of the moment, like, hey, here's my first draft, here's my first, this is the thing, the first thing I'm gonna do, and it's a big thing to, fall, you know, to drop that far in the draft. So, yeah, I mean, I I totally understand there were, you know, people who maybe said, look, you don't get to draft that high in the draft. In, in theory, they're not going to draft that high every year. People hope they're not going to draft mm -hmm. that high every year. And so you should get a player, you know, like, you know, they, whenever you have the seventh pick and William Eklund falls to you, you have to do it yeah. because they might have taken him at two or three or four that year. I just, there wasn't that guy. There wasn't a, you know, a guy that that they would have liked to have taken at five, fell, fell to them at yeah. eleven. So, and like you said, they they had really identified that they liked a bunch of players. I don't think they were necessarily looking for the three guys that they got, right. but they probably had like a group of like eight guys that they really liked mm -hmm. in the twenty to fifty range. And so, 
yeah, that's what they, I mean. That's what they did. You know, we'll we'll see how it goes. I mean, in the I look at it like from a like a mathematical standpoint, it's a the process it was 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 perfect. They you have like a, a value chart for how much each pick is worth, and those three picks are worth more than the one that they traded away. So, but as I mentioned in the story, like. Ten years from now, no one's going to say, "Oh, remember when Mike Greer won the trade value?" Yeah. You know, on with his chart. Like that's, people are going to look at the players, and it's going to be the players. But I mean, the process was good, sound, and now it's up to the scouts to have picked the right guys and for this new player development team that they're about to hire and mm-hmm. get on board that to develop these guys, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, let's yeah. talk about that just briefly. Like they mentioned that they're going to be boostering that player development mm-hmm. team because right now it was a one man team of John McCarthy, right, or one man person yeah, show. Yeah, and also like I mean, if getting Nabokov is sort of like the goalie development guy, so I wouldn't. I mean, it, it, it wasn't exactly just one guy, but it was essentially one and a half or, right. or, or something like that, right? So, but yeah, that's what they, they said. They're gonna, you know, Mike said he wants to hire somewhere in the neighborhood of three or four player development people. He wants to hire a couple of analytics guys, mm-hmm. people. Shouldn't say guys, um, and. He also wants to add someone, and, and I, I was I wondered about this before he mentioned it. Just the idea of like the brain trust of the Sharks has been Doug Wilson Senior. and Tim Burke and Joe Will for twenty years. Yeah, and um, so Mike Greer comes in, and it seems for now for sure like that he's going to keep Joe Will and Tim Burke and Doug Wilson Junior. Um, but I assumed or thought I w- wanted to hear him say it at least anyway that he's going to bring someone else in um, because I, I mean our other. Other NHL front offices are bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Not not all of them, but some but some of them are. And also, I just feel like you know if he's in a in kind of the war room and it's him and he's just going to want somebody else that he knows has known for a lot for longer and sort of as a balanced out to the you know. He kind of <laughs> mentioned that that because um, he was kind of in that role as an assistant GM mm-hmm. roughly in was it uh, the, the Rangers, Rangers right? Yeah, yeah. So he's working with Chris Drury, who he used to play with a long time right. ago. And to me, like I'm still expecting. We're going to see some trades between the Rangers and the Sharks, <laughs> I think, because yeah. they have such a good relationship. And when we interviewed Doug Wilson years ago, um, he mentioned that, like, like, we always wanted to know, like, how do how do you get trades going? Like, what do you do? Do you call up your GM? You're, are you guys just buddies? Do you only call your friends? Do you call everybody? How does that work? And we joked, like, do you have a special, like, bat phone that just goes directly to each GM or something? Mm-hmm. Um, but he mentioned that most of these guys, they're all old teammates of each other, played against each other, or, yeah. you know, it's kind of a good old boys network in a way. But Greer, Greer is one of the younger ones, younger GMs in the league. Yeah. But he's played with or against a lot of these guys, so and he's well respected by everybody. So he's already kind of in crowd and kind of has his own. I don't want to say his own guys, but kind of like his go-to guys. And and I feel like the Rangers would be one of them. He did mention um, on Wednesday. I just sort of asked him like it was his first. I mean, it was just he gets hired on Tuesday and on Wednesday <laughs> is his first GM's meeting. It's yeah. like literally the night. It's like the first thing. So I was just like, so did. Was everybody in there trying to get you to trade with them, or you were like, "Hey, you know what? And he, was like, he, he was like, Ev- everybody was really nice." You yeah. know, we, we were just talking about it. So yeah, you're right. There is, there is something to that. Like, um, whether he's played against some of the GMs or played with some, played with some of them, you just you you do have to sort of know people, and you do have to. Mm. There is an aspect of, like, you can, yeah, I don't know. You you can you could like script out how you want your GM to act or how you want to be but there are, there is a human element to the idea of like you have to get the other person on the on the other line to yeah. a talk to you be like feel comfortable dealing with you and so yeah I, I think all that stuff you know I think I think he's gonna be fine with mm-hmm. all with all that um, I mean well, well the, as far as the Rangers I think we're gonna talk about coaches at some point I think there's yeah exactly that's, I, um, that was the next thing is yeah. coaching staff he's got to fill out and right. big rumor of the Rangers' former coach that he would. Well, yeah. Hire. So not just yeah. So all right. So the, uh, you're right. Yeah. Another show. So yeah. So David Quinn coached for the Rangers. Um, he so he didn't. It's sort of a X Y Z thing. Like <laughs> David Quinn is very very close with John Hines, mm-hmm. and John Hines is very very close with Mike Greer, and so John Hines hired Mike Greer in New Jersey. Um, like David Quinn and Mike Greer aren't necessarily super close. I'm. I'm I know that they're friends or right. whatever, but like it's just there's just sort of like a connect the dots connection, and also there's like sort of the BU, Boston University hockey community just mm-hmm. sort of stays together, kind of thing. Um, Chris, Drew, I mean, so Chris Drury and John Hines and and 
biker all played together at Boston University. Mm -hmm. The other person that I have heard a little bit of, you know, people asking, are, are they going to talk to this guy, is Chris Knobloch, who was the Rangers AHL coach in Hartford. Mm -hmm. Another, you know, connect the dots. Like he was an assistant GM or a, advisor slash assistant GM for the Rangers. Um, Chris Knobloch is somebody who's been an AHL coach for a while and people think are probably ready for, is ready for an NHL job. So those are a couple of names. I mean, I... I, there, I mean, I think another, like, you, you sort of just look around and say, okay, which which people who are probably on lists to begin with also have connections to him. And so, like, to me, one another one is Jeff Halpern, who played with him for a few years in, in Washington. And, I mean, Jeff Halpern is probably on a lot of people's lists because yeah. he's been an assistant coach with the Lightning, and they've won a lot of games the past few years. <laughs> yeah. And and it's it's not all just because they have, you know, I mean, like Derek Lalonde just got hired by the Red Wings, and... Um, if Jeff Halpern doesn't get this job, he's probably, you know, I'm sure next year he'll be interviewing for jobs. So he's another one. And there, I mean, there are just other, some of the other sort of, you know, Rick Tockett was up for a few jobs. So it wouldn't surprise me if they, if they tried to talk to him. Um, I, I think that's one thing, like if, whenever it's somebody like Greer has sort of just connections to so many people, mm -hmm. like he played in a different bunch of different places. He's worked for the Blackhawks, the Devils, and the Rangers um, since he stopped playing. He just I just think he'll, it won't be hard for him to find people that he can trust or be comfortable with to interview for the job. So. He's very well connected. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the draft now. The first mm -hmm. picks was the Sharks traded down and got the 27th overall pick, and they picked Philip Bystead. Uh, he was a center, uh, a big wing, or a big center, who's fast, uh, yeah. can protect the puck, and that was all actually quoted from his buddy who also got drafted later, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Havlid. But um, by said, um, Doug Wilson Jr. said that he caught their eye, he won a championship, he played a role in the national team, uh, he's at a premium position with size and speed. So I think a lot of people will, um, kind of consider this a reach at the 27th overall, that they could have been there in the second round. Um, but does it really matter if, if it's the guy that you like? You might as well go after him, right? Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. I mean, the fact that they had 27, 34, and 45, I mean, maybe he would have been there at 34, maybe not. Um, I think, well, look, he, you know, he, everybody looks at the lists that come out before the draft, and mm -hmm. he, nobody had him 27th. I think um, they got Corey Promden from The Athletic had him at 38 on his list. I think that was the highest I saw him anywhere. There was one other list that had him in the 30s, I think, but there were others like, you know, I, so we have Corey Promen and we have Scott Wheeler, and they mm -hmm. they are both great at their jobs, and they both think differently about the game, and they both so it's you know there are guys that he was actually Bystep was one of the guys that you know Corey had him at thirty eight and Scott had him at fifty eight I think something like that. So you see Scott's list and say, oh man, that's they that's a bad pick, and but they saw a six foot three, six foot four ish uh, center who can really skate and. Um, I, I think it's actually the, the to me one of the most interesting things about this trade is that they traded eleven for twenty seven and a couple of other picks, and the guy that went at eleven is Connor Geeky, who was a six three six four center Seriously. who can really skate, yeah. and people like him more than Bystet. But there were also some people like I you would see some different things from scouts that there were definitely teams that didn't like Connor Geeky, like thought that they were because this is also this is one thing that Corey and Scott mentioned to me a couple of times in Montreal. Whenever I would ask about like what happened to Jonathan Lecker Mackey, you mm -hmm. know Willie Mecklen's teammate, he he fell and Joachim Kimmel fell and they, it happens every year. Centers and defensemen, size size centers and defensemen, they they get bumped up. You know, everyone makes their list and you say, hey, look, there's this little winger who can really score, but you know, when you're on the floor, whenever you're making your list, like that six three center, because it, yes, the game is trending to be smaller yeah. and. Sort of faster, but not necessarily. Like I wouldn't say that guys like William Eklund are super fast, but they're super skilled, right? Mm -hmm. Smaller and skilled. Like I, you know, the team that I used to cover, the Devils, right? Like they have Jack Hughes and they have Nico Heischer, and everybody thinks they're set for a decade. Yeah, two amazing players. I still feel like at some point they're going to be in the second round or an Eastern Conference Finals, and they're going to wish they had a six-four center. Mm -hmm. Like they're going to, they're. It depends on now. If the other team doesn't have that, that's fine. But like. At some point, you might run into Quinton Byfield, or you might run into a team that has Matt Berniers and Shane Wright, or just yeah. whatever. Like, so it's, it, the Especially idea, the center position, right, right. The, the idea that you don't need that. I mean, like, 
you, you do to a point. Like I'm not somebody who thinks like you should just put out six little guys, and I'm not somebody right. who thinks you should put out the you know the Legion of Doom mm -hmm. or, or whatever, like or like just whatever. Um, you know, so like the, the, the like I, I feel like you look at the well, the way things shake out, and you know if you have a if Tomas Bordalo is going to be a center for you for a long time, maybe then you've got a guy like uh, Brandon Coe who has some size who can play with him, and then. So then maybe that means that Philip Eistead, if he develops enough, can play with one of these other, you know, like a Tristan Robbins or a William Eklund or something like that. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. So not bad. So uh, almost <laughs> in a way, like Geeky, they traded down and got kind of the next size person that's, or the next person yeah, that's about Yeah, I was trying to find, yeah, I mean, there, there weren't a lot of centers, a lot of bigger centers that went in between them. So it was sort of like a... So someone slightly lesser than Geeky, yeah. but... I mean, not quite the same tier, but maybe one tier down. But then you're adding two more players yeah. right, you know, right after that. So you're getting, to me, it's more value because you're getting more hits on the on the well, I, list. I also think that, you know, just because I mean, we we just talked about how guys, some guys pop at 15, and some guys pop at 17, some at 20. Like, um, you know, Corey Priman did a list of like who, let's say everybody make, meets their full potential, everybody maxes yeah. out their development. Who are the guys that have the highest ceiling in this draft class? And he had Bystead at, I think it was 15 or 16 somewhere. So like, I mean, he definitely believes, he definitely believes that there is more in there for him to mm -hmm. sort of figure out over the next couple of years. So yeah, you're right. They they, they picked up a couple extra guys. They, um, I you know I af, at the end of the after the first round and before the second round started, I had I had messaged. I, I was talking to Scott and I had said I bet. I would bet that they're going to take somebody at 34 or 45 that you guys thought they should have taken at 27, <laughs> and it's just all going to work itself out. And, to right. it. and I think that's sort of, like if they had taken either of the two guys at 34 or 45 and at 27 then, and yeah. then taken Bystead at 45, people would be like, ah, that's a great draft. Yeah. So I, I think generally everybody, you know, mo you know, both Corey and Scott, and I saw a couple other people from other publications thought that they, they had a good day too. Right. We'll see, you know, now sometimes... If you have a bad day one, the rest of the draft just doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, but you know, people liked you know two, three, four of the guys that they took on on the on day two. So, right. So day two, starting with uh, the thirty fourth overall, they took Cameron Lund, another center, yeah. and uh, we actually have a clip of Cameron explaining what he kind of models his game after and who he thinks he plays. Like who, he, not that he's going to be this person, but right. so here we go. Here's the clip of of Lund. Yeah, I'd say I'm a big offensive wing. I mean, a lot of offensive ability, skating, speed. Um, can shoot the puck from anywhere, that playmaking ability too. And then I kind of try to model my game after Jack Eichel. I mean, someone I've watched since college hockey, and it's just the one guy I really try to model my game after. Uh, all right, that's Cameron uh, straight from Boston with his accents. And uh, he kind of reminds me of that kid from Stranger Things. So he's got a little bit of a lisp there. That's kind of mm -hmm. funny. And cut the curly hair. Um, all right, the next... Next pick at 45th overall was Matthias, Matthias Havlid, uh, right-handed defenseman, and he plays for the same team as Bystead, which was interesting. Um, and they happen to be friends. Yeah. So uh, I have another clip here of, oh, you want to say something? Well, I was just going to say it was, you know, like, I think people were, were sort of knocking the Sharks for going for, like, the big toolsy guy, and then they took his little skilled. We were just talking <laughs> yeah. about, like, big tools versus little skill, and yeah. Havlid is... He's that. He's like five nine, five ten, but he's like a super skilled uh, guy. So I, I mean, you know, I, th I think that was like an interesting mix. Um, just, Absolutely. I, uh, people, there were definitely some people who really like him. Like, they, like he might be the. It would. It wouldn't be that crazy for him to be the best one of the. Of the so he's like the kind of a Carlson and um, uh, Ryan Merkley kind of like a smooth skater. Yeah. And smaller. I, I mean, he he said that you know that Eric is his idol, and yeah. then, you know every five ten defenseman from Sweden is going to say that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he's definitely a. Offensive guy, you know, good with the puck, good mm -hmm. skater. Yeah. So. All right, so here's this clip of who he models his game after and uh, also his buddy being on the team. Uh, you know, just just happy. Uh, you know, it's such a big deal, this. It's a dream come true. And to be drafted by the Sharks, uh, my best buddy got drafted yesterday by Step, so couldn't be, couldn't be happier. Uh, you know, I always like to watch Eric Carlson when he plays. Uh, you know, says has been my big idol, and now being drafted by the Sharks and the place there is really cool, actually. So, uh, you know, that's that's the big player I always looked up to. And, uh, things I need to improve. We'll probably say some defensive stuff. Uh, 
pretty much, I don't know, you know, getting better in every way I want to, but you know, take small things at a time. So another small defenseman taking the Sharks. Um, sounds like another offensive small defenseman that can't play defense, which the Sharks tend to really <laughs> love having on their team. I'm sure some people, you know, jump in the comments on that. Mm. Um, but yeah, anything else you want to add to about Havlid? No, well, I mean I, I do think it was interesting that they mentioned, um, like they have William Eklund and and his William Eklund's Swedish team had they had three guys go in the first round and another guy go in the second round. And, but they took the two kids from the team that, that played them in the final of their junior league. Um, and beat them. Yeah, and beat them, yeah. Uh, they, yeah, they were... Uh, but yeah, no, I, I just I think that that's like... Uh, I think between those two guys and then you have the uh, Lund and the next guy that we're going to talk about, Fisher, like those guys are going to play at Northeastern together. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's an interesting... It'll be an interesting thing to sort of watch them... Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool together, that they get to yeah. play together and be together. Um, I think that's going to help kind of the culture too. If they're, you know, I'm assuming they're they're good guys and good heads on their <laughs> shoulders, so that they get to have their buddies built in, and and you know, assuming none of them get traded and they eventually make the Sharks at some point, um, that'll just make the the whole organization, the team better. Mm -hmm. um, so the next guy they took in the third round is Michael Fisher, as you yep. mentioned, another right-handed defenseman. Uh, took him at 76th 76th overall. Uh, go ahead. You want to say anything about Fisher? Well, I, I mean, he's another guy like uh, bigger, um, maybe a little more toolsy than than like present production per se. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I do think he, that was another one where people were like, you know what, man, he they, he probably could have gone a little bit higher. They were just just an interesting maybe a guy, some not somebody who's gonna like pop right away, but maybe after you know two or three years at Northeastern could be a could certainly be an interesting. Aspect for them. For I sure. feel like defensemen kind of take a little bit longer to develop, yeah. especially for the, if they get to the NHL level. But just in general, defensemen compared to you know forwards, especially skilled forwards, they're going to kind of have a, a quicker path than right. defensemen because defense is, is a lot harder of a game to learn. You know, it's a lot of positioning and, and all kinds of little minute things that you really need to, to do very well um, compared to like. Probably a winger would be the easiest one because you have less defensive responsibilities compared to a centerman, um, and obviously less than a defenseman. Um, so defensemen kind of take a little bit longer, other than those super top, top notch, yeah, top yeah. tier yeah. players in there. So yeah, you never know what you're gonna get. Um, I remember the days when Doug Wilson, I, and I feel like because he was a former defenseman, always seemed to be drafting defensemen, looking for that. Chris Pronger type <laughs> of a giant defenseman that can skate and move and be skillful, which yeah. you know, so many picks just ended up getting wasted and, and not used very well. Yeah. And that's a whole other story. But um, yeah, so defensemen take a little bit longer. Um, going to the next pick, uh, the, the Sharks picked up a goalie here. Mason, is it Bopit? Bopit, I believe. Bopit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anything on Mason that you got? Just, uh, he's big. <laughs> yeah. And he was, he was very tall. Uh, no, I, you know, yeah. Oh, man, so uh, the one thing I'll say about goalies is like, um, I like some organizations should just take one every year, and I kind of like, I kind of like that idea. Like, I don't, they're almost like running backs. That's like kind of a yeah. weird comparison that people like to make, but I, I do think that I, yeah, I, I wouldn't take one really high unless it was like, you know, no doubt, you know, there's only been a, a few of those guys where you're like, oh yeah, you got to take this guy, uh, but otherwise, yeah, just. You know, find somebody who can identify some traits in your go in goalies that that you can sort of flesh out and take one in the middle rounds every year and every four or five years one might actually one might pop. Work. It's, it's yeah. actually interesting that we were talking about goalies and I was I'm actually working on a story about uh, when they drafted Evgeny Nabokov mm -hmm. and just the yeah, it was amazing to hear Tim Burke and Joe Will talk about how they had <laughs> Evgeny Nabokov and, and um, Kiprasov. Kiprasov. Toss and um, Moose Hedberg. Oh, yeah, they had yeah. all three of those guys at yeah. the same time. Like, just I was like, wow, that was <laughs> yeah, yeah. You hope to get like one of those guys every four or five years, not yeah. bang, 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 right? But so, yeah, no, I, you know, he's gonna, he, he, you know, he was one of the. They only took two guys out of the Canadian Junior League, which mm -hmm. this was something I was gonna bring up, like near the end, like as an overall. Yeah, do they not like, have enough scouts in the? No, no, the I just, league? just I think they were. They said they were focused on. Like sort of taking more guys that are going to take longer to develop. Like they wanted 
guys from from they were going to college or guys mm-hmm. who were in you know yeah they because were, yeah, they, they took a couple out of high school right, right like they took actual high school kids and they took yeah. one though uh, you know somebody out of the USHL who um, yeah they, they took like, two guys that aren't even going to play college hockey next year it's going to be the year after that basically and I I mean it you know it, we'll see if it works out but the logic is sound to me like they Mike Greer wants to sort of install this holistic player development department will give them some kids to develop and mm-hmm. you know instead of because if you take kids from Canadian junior leagues you only have two years basically you have to sign them within the, there's a deadline two years from Thursday or two years from yeah. Friday to sign those kids and whereas kids from Europe and kids that go to college you have four years for the college kids and different the, the European thing is a different thing but mm-hmm. anyway uh, but yeah so you just they're going to have whoever they put in this player development department is going to have more time with some of these kids. So they took they took some swings on guys late in the draft that were maybe sort of out, you know, not necessarily on everybody's list or whatever, but they were successful guys at, at high schools at, mm-hmm. from non traditional places. And um, yeah, it'll be it'll sort of be interesting to see how that how that works out. Yeah, I mean the next one is uh, well from the, from juniors is Jake Furlong, who's a left handed defenseman. Yeah. He was 104th overall. Um, that was another, or that was the other one out of, the, out of juniors. But the next one, Joey Muldowney, was from high school. Yep. It's from Nichols High School in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll just blow through these in the next ones. <laughs> uh, Eli Barnett uh, from Victoria, BCHL. And then uh, the last one here is Reese Laubuck. Laubuck? Yep. Laubuck. Um, he's actually from San Jose. Right. And uh, grew <laughs> up in Almaden, so not too far from here, and uh, played in the Sharks organization, the Junior Sharks program. Um, we actually have a clip of him uh, talking about how excited he was and his favorite player growing up uh, as a big Sharks fan, which is kind of cool. So here's his clip. Uh, My favorite Sharks player growing up was Joe Pavelski. Uh, Actually, as you can see in the background, I wore eight because of him um, as I grew up since I was eight or nine. But uh, yeah, he was my favorite player. I loved uh, going to the rink, seeing him. I actually met him a couple times. So that was like my dream when I was younger. So the Sharks ended up getting drafting nine players in the draft in seven rounds. That's that's a lot of prospects being added into their cupboard. Um, I remember two, three years ago, the Sharks had one of the worst prospects in the league, or kind of rated mm-hmm. as one of the worst. They just didn't have anyone. Um, now I feel like they're closer to the middle of the pack. I don't know about these guys. We probably won't know these guys till another year or two if they actually like hit on any of these guys, if they're going to be good prospects. But Adding nine players into your prospects cupboard is uh, is a pretty good pretty good thing. Yeah, and they had eleven picks, but they traded two of them uh, for next for next year. year. Yeah, yeah. That, it just sometimes it, that just happens. You just get to, you either get to a spot in the draft and you're just like, uh, we don't really like anybody right here in this spot. Or mm-hmm. also having three seventh round picks was probably you know, one too many. So there's a, there's a lot of seventh round picks to get traded. Yeah. Um, because you just you just sort of get to the end of your list and you're like oh okay well we don't have anybody left so um, yeah no you're right I, I think like the 2020 class is sort of the big um, you know all those guys are mm-hmm. that that was that's sort of like been the signature draft from the past few years and they got a lot of interesting guys you know it's like those guys plus William Eklund um, and so yeah you're right I, they were I do remember, you know, two, three, four years ago, there was, you know, they were scraping the bottom of the barrel on all these mm-hmm. prospect lists, and yeah, I think they will be probably in, you know, in the in the middle somewhere going into next year, and yeah, I just I think like they, I think they found, they might have a couple guys that played last year that that might I don't know if any of those guys are going to turn into, you know, first line players or even yeah. even you know, but if if, they, if let's say one of those guys that played last year turns into a you know. A second line guy or maybe two or three of them turn into solid third liners and then these guys that are coming now are the guys that sort of push up above them mm-hmm. there's you know there, there's certainly you can certainly look out two or three years from now and say they, they, they've, they've got something certainly more so than you know three or four years ago when it was like well you know hopefully they'll, they'll just continue to find some older guys to fill in around the stars that they have because there wasn't a whole lot coming mm-hmm. absolutely yeah, yeah it'll, be, it'll be good to, and now that I'm a Barracuda season mm. ticket holder, I'm gonna be. Oh, Gannon and Laroc too. Jesus. Oh, yeah. oh right. So I yeah. like that. I mean, I got like I said, I got here in January. Didn't really know a whole lot about yeah. the, the, the various prospects. Knew who William Eklund was. and knew who Bordalo was because mm-hmm. I've seen that Michigan team play a hundred times. Uh, it's just been like a pretty steady diet of like 
it's pretty clear that the Sharks think they have something with that kid. Like yeah. they think he's he was clearly the break the breakout prospect of this of this past season. Um, like Brandon Crow had a Brandon Crow had a great year in mm-hmm. in the OHL and like all, they were all pretty successful. But they're just they're very high on getting the rock. Now the I've talked to like our guys and you know they see some potential there that they're probably not as high on. But it just it's it's interesting to me that like to a man everybody in that department has sort of picked out this guy as like hey we we really think we might have something here so that's and, and that's a, and that's a big spot for them because we still don't really know for sure what ryan merkley is going to be there's been mm-hmm. some flashes here and there um, but beyond him you know going into this season it was like all these exciting interesting forwards and ryan merkley right and now it's like well there's another one and you know and now they've picked up honestly now that they've these two guys that they took um Havlitt and fisher like they've that there's something there now like they've got like they sort of restocked the, mm-hmm. the the defense pool, and there's some interesting guys to, to watch out yeah, for. Yeah, and at the time, Ryan Murphy was like the top prospect for at least two years. Yeah. They didn't have anyone yeah. else that was even in the same realm as him. It is interesting, I should just mention quick too, like I was probably guilty of this um, as much as anybody, like because they drafted Ryan Merkley, who was a guy who probably should have gone a lot higher, mm-hmm. but fell because of various concerns about his defensive ability, um, he had some. Attitude, he had some. Yeah, man. he had some attitude issues um, when he was younger. I thought that it was like, well, they are the team that took Ryan Merkley, so maybe they'll be. As, as twenty seven was coming along, I was like, okay, here comes Brad Lambert because yeah. he was like the guy in this draft class who was like, could have. I mean, I remember like we talked about how Shane Wright was like when they were sixteen. It was Shane Wright and Brad Lambert. It was like mm-hmm. one, two. I'm sure if you go back and find somebody's list from two years ago of who was going to be two years from now, who's going to be it was it was those two guys, and so he just sort of steadily like for Shane Wright it wasn't he had just like sort of a half of a bad year, whereas yeah. Brad Lambert has been steadily falling on people's lists for a long time, and so I think he ended up at 28 or 30 30 I think it was to the to the Jets and the, um, the first round yeah yeah end of the first a couple picks later but mm. so I mean that was yeah, like I said that was just a you know he. He was sort of a home run swing, but whenever he got down to that part, because the talent is there, but we no one really is really sure what's what to make of right. him. So, yeah. yeah, and that's like, I mean, for the Jets, it's a great pick yeah. for them. That's someone who could, you know, very high ceiling. Yeah. Like there was uh, there was a, a, a few people who said before this draft that Lambert was the guy. It was Lambert and the Russian kid who was dealing with cancer were the two guys that, if you had a f- if you had two picks or three picks, like you take them with with one of one of your own. So Winnipeg did that with Lambert. Right? Mm-hmm. Smart, smart on Winnipeg. <laughs> um, all right, now moving on from the draft, the Sharks made a trade. John Leonard uh, and a third round pick went to Nashville for Luke Coonan. Mm-hmm. Um, Coonan was a first round, first round drafty, I mm-hmm. believe. Uh, to me, I feel like this is a kid who's going to be slotting in as a third line center because um, he does play as a center. I don't know. Yeah, he's I don't gonna, know. He may not play center for the. He's, he's kind of bounced back and forth. I think he'll. You know, we'll see. I, I I would imagine that this coming season, the third line center will either be Bordelow or Benino. But he he's like the you know if um, he's like the you know if 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 Bordelow somebody gets if, out well, I was gonna say circle. yeah, I was yeah. Like if gets out of the circle or if Hurdle or Couture or Benino leaves the game in the first period with an injury, you mm-hmm. just slot him over there. So. Um, Anyway, yeah. yeah, the Sharks tend to do that, too. They always have <laughs> extra centermen playing on yeah. the wing. Yeah. Um, exactly Doesn't for that it. reason. Especially when Joe Thornton played and he got kicked out of the circle almost <laughs> half the time. It was You needed another centerman. Right. Um, so, yeah, what do you do? You know much about this guy? And, and it, what do you think of the trade? Is the value? You know, they trade a yeah. third-round pick for next season, which is supposed to be an even deeper draft for this yeah. guy. So there's going to be more pressure on him to play and, and perform. He's only twenty four. Well, right, right. Yeah, no, I think he um I don't like I, I saw other people saying that too. Oh like oh, the third round pick in a deep draft. Like whenever whenever someone says it's a deep draft, they're talking about like the twentieth pick yeah. or the fifteenth pick. Yeah. The seventy eighth pick is the same no, I would say the same in every draft, but it's pretty close. So, um yeah, I don't know. I mean I didn't my initial reaction wasn't like, Oh wow, they won this trade or oh wow, that was terrible. It was just kind of in the middle. Um I understand, like the idea. Of, uh, first off, like it's his first trade for an NHL player, and so yeah. we were all gonna like jump to too many conclusions. <laughs> like um, that was another thing. Whenever they were about to pick at twenty-seven, one of the other kids that was available was Reed Schaefer from Seattle, the Seattle Thunderbirds, and I think Edmonton took him right right in that range. And he's like a 
like I've just thought like, oh man, if they take Reed Schaefer, oh, we're all going to be writing this guy plays just like Mike Greer did, and <laughs> yeah. that's why they. So anyway, Luke Coonan plays just like Mike Greer did, so that's you know like there is some sort of narrative there, but I just I think that like he's young, ish, you know, like twenty four is not super super young. Well, that's similar with Jonathan Dolan, but mm-hmm. um, you know I don't I don't think he's ever going to be again. He's not. I don't think he's going to be a first line guy. I don't no. don't even necessarily think he's ever or should play on the second line per se but like he has produced better than some of the second line guys from last season in San Jose That's anyway. Not saying much. Yeah. <laughs> no. I think the big thing is like that he there is you know he does take too many or he has taken too many penalties in the past that will be something that that he will probably be trying to clean up or work on. I, I also just it was interesting to me that they these the, like Bob Bugner and Mike Greer are not connected now in really any way shape or form. But Bob Bugner, like every time they played the Predators last year, we would talk. We would talk to him, and he would talk about. I don't know. There was just all, almost this like the, the the Sharks were really like kind of admired the way that the Predators, the way that they played, mm-hmm. like the way that they. If, 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 around the league, there was a narrative about them fighting. They they fought way more than everybody else. So whatever. It wasn't just the fighting. It was just the. All that stuff that Mike Greer talked about in the beginning yeah. of our clip, right? Like in your face, yeah. yeah. Tenacity, well, good skater in your face. Like Luke Coonan is an in your face guy. Now, is that going to translate to more goals, more shot attempts? We'll see. Uh, but it's a culture thing. Yeah, yeah. I, and so, like, you know, they didn't. I don't think they gave. A, like, I think John Leonard could be can be an NHL player. I don't think he's going to be a super high impact guy. No. Um, so. And they've got a bunch of other forwards who are, are similar to him or might surpass him very soon. So, you know, I think, but, it, you know, the age fit right with what they were looking for. He's not going to cost a ton of money. Mm-hmm. I, you know, they're, I think they're just looking for some NHL guys in that, you know, two, three million dollar range that they mm-hmm. can slide in. And, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think if he, if anything, like, if he turns out to be like an, an upgrade over, say, Matt Nieto or what Andrew Cogliano was last year. Like mm-hmm. a, like those guys were good culture fits, um, but they also had bad years, like yeah. just on the ice. So I'm, you know, if, if that's if it's a, that's a very sm, you know slim marginal upgrade, but it's it's something. Well, it's so. an upgrade over Leonard for sure. He was the guy yeah. who couldn't really crack the lineup. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have a clip here of Mike Greer and his thoughts of the trade. Uh, he was asked about it, so we'll show this clip here of Mike Greer after his very first NHL player trade. Uh, high character kid, uh, plays the game hard, competes hard, uh, got some really good leadership qualities. So he's got a lot of the, the things that we that we'd like to bring into the team and the organization. And you know, I think he fits in nicely with uh, some of the core values that I have and, and, and we have as an organization. So that was Mike Greer's thoughts. Uh, you have something else to add to it? Yeah, I, so like I noticed that there was, like again, we, everybody's gonna rush to conclusions. This was the first player that he traded for. Oh man, like I, I don't think that Mike Greer is going to trade for 10 more Luke Coonins. Right. I don't think yeah. that, um, like just because the first guy that they traded for is a, you know, a, a character gritty guy that that's necessarily gonna but I think the I think he looked over the roster and the organization as a whole before he got the job and said you know if I do get this job this is you know we need we need a couple more of those guys so that's I mean I think you know it it, how you construct a roster is that there's a million different ways to skin this thing but like Mm -hmm. you know you can have really good players at the top of your roster and also have a guy who has a 45% Corsi, you know, on your third or fourth line. Now, the problem is, is if you have six of those guys, then you're yeah. in trouble. Yeah. So that's... <laughs> yeah, and this is a guy, again, it's kind of... Um, he's bigger too, right? He's... He's, yeah, he's good medium size. <laughs> medium size, okay. Bigger than Leonard, because Leonard was kind of small, yeah, kind of small winger. Small, fast. Yeah, I'm seeing it more yeah. of a replacement of Leonard uh, mm-hmm. and, again, into that third to fourth line guy, mm-hmm. gritty guy. Um, I do want to see the Sharks kind of get a little bit more gritty and in your face, especially if they're not going to be super competitive next season. Um, I mean, I'm hoping they are. But who knows what's going to happen with, with more moves between now and then. We still don't even have a coach on the team, so we don't know what the style will be. Um, 
But anyway, uh, moving on from that, uh, this Wednesday is going to be free agency. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if the Sharks will be able to sign anybody. Yeah. Um, and if they do, if it'll be any kind of an impact player. There's not too much on the market. Um, the big name players, I think the Sharks are just going to be out of commission yeah. for. They're not going to be also, able to afford like, them. Three, I feel like somebody new has signed every day. It, it, like a week ago, yeah. everybody was like, wow, this is, there's, look at all these players that are going to be available on July yeah. 13th. And now, like, Forsberg has signed and Latang has signed. And um, there was somebody else too that just signed. But anyway, it's, I, I looked at the, like, you look at like the top 30 list and it doesn't look quite as robust. Yeah. Uh, I think there are some interesting guys in there. There's like, like, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, if Johnny Gaudreau and if Kenny Malkin and uh, Patrice Bergeron get to July 13th, I don't, expect to be seeing them in the San Jose uniform next year. Yeah. But there are some interesting guys further down the list. I mean, I know um, Mason Marchman has been a popular name uh, over the past couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I just I think there are a few guys like that like, you know, I don't like they don't have the money. They could they could create more cap space. We'll see if the, any of that anything shakes out over the next yeah. couple of days with that. Um, but you know, as of right now, they I mean, they don't have a lot of space right now. We don't know what's exactly going to happen with the Vander Kane and his contract situation, which could be another, Giraffe another, you yeah. know, another deal with the cap space. So, I, yeah, I don't expect them to be super busy this week. But um, there is, like I said, there is still time for them if they wanted to try to move out a salary or two to. Because the other thing, like, well, I mean, I think everybody has been very focused on the cap space and the money and. That's a good thing to be focused on. Right. Um, they also have too many players right now. Like yeah. it's it's crazy. Like like they traded John Leonard, and we're but they like we're talking player. about it. yeah. Like yeah. we don't. So they have, they just have like they're gonna have like thirty ish. If they sign every restricted free agent, cap friendly says thirty seven right now. Yeah, well, and, before and, they've signed, right, right. And the, but uh, just like just if you take all the guys that played some games last year, and then you add, like they just just you know look at the defense. Like they have nine. They're gonna have, mm-hmm. if you count Merkley and Malosh as like NHL guys, they have nine NHL defensemen. That's too many. Can't mm-hmm. have that many. Uh, and um, they have three what, goalies, twenty forwards, and three, yeah. and then three goalies is another thing. Like, and I know that like how Mike Mike Greer has said a couple times now, like, look, it can just be a competition. They can. I I still think that they will probably. Well, the if, Rangers are in a market for right. backup, aren't they? Well, and and also too, <laughs> like there were, there was a big commotion amongst all the goalies at the draft but there are still like too many teams that need one and not enough goalies to go around so I do think that like you know waiting until all the other chair you know waiting until the music stops and there's a team or two out there that doesn't have a doesn't have the guy that they want then there's going to be reason to and I, I and that whole thing I mean that's been one of the more interesting things right like a discussion topic is do you trade James Reimer because he has the most value, or do you want James Reimer because he's also the best goalie that can make you win the most games next year? And I do wonder if, like what we talked about earlier about how like maybe we've hit the brakes a little bit on the win, 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 win thing that maybe you know James Reimer is older, he has one, only has one year left on his contract, maybe that makes it more likely that they will move him it and they like can sort of go with Kacken and, and, and Hill or, or both Youngish, they're both in that 25, 26, which is younger for that's not young for a forward, but it is for Goalies, a goalie. Yeah. And just sort of let them see which one, because I don't think they, you know, we're sitting here today and say who's who's the Sharks goalie in 2025. We don't know. There's, yeah. there's no. I mean, it could be Gakken and it could be Hill. It could be Ben Gaudreau if he, you know, if he works Develops, out like it. Yeah. So um, it could be somebody who's out there you know, on a different team right now. So I, I do think, yeah, like I said, I, I just think that. Between now and it might, it probably won't happen between now and Wednesday, but at some point, um, between now and camp, they, I don't think they're going to come to camp with all of these guys who, because because the other thing is like you look at all these guys who are RFAs like a Malash and um, well, I mean Ferrar is going to make the team obviously, but the, right. all these are, like if we'll we'll see what happens with Jonathan Dolan and we'll see what happens with a couple of these other guys, but if they all end up with contracts. Um, they all have to require waivers to go down to, to go down to the Barracuda now, whereas they didn't last year before when they were on their entry level deal. Yeah. So it's like I, I I don't think they're going to come to camp with thirty guys. And who you can could add Luke Kuhn into that list because yeah, he's yeah, also he's in our fan. Yeah, so. Needs to get signed. Yeah. And then, so I mean, it's I think it'll be good for them to. They're going to have more sort of NHL experience depth than they've had the past couple of years because all these guys got experience, like 
Sasha Chimlowski and mm-hmm. um, you know Noah Gregor. Well, Noah Gregor is, is pretty established at this point, but just all these like sort of youngish guys. So on one hand, there's going to be a lot of competition at camp, and on the other hand, there's like there's no reason to put Ozzy Weisblatt or Brandon Coe or even I mean even Bordalo and and Eklund are probably people are probably going to pencil them in for spots, yeah. but they're going to have to actually earn it. And if they don't earn it, or they don't, so they don't if they don't outright win a job. The Sharks don't have to put those guys on the opening night lineup and play them 18 minutes. They can mm-hmm. let them play a lot for the Barracuda for a month or two, and then and then let them get rolling with the Sharks. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, there's a there's a lot coming. My career's got his hands full. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone's like, "Oh man, why why would he take that job?" Like that's that's the job. That's what you do. Is yeah. and, and well, yeah. also there's only 32 of them. And right. So, right. Yeah. Right. And the, and I, you know it is like I have you know people would say like if you look at the contracts that they have. And you look at the fact that they've missed the playoffs three years in a row, and it there. I mean, look, it's it's definitely one of the most challenging out there. If you were going to rank them one to thirty-two right yeah. now, it's one of the more challenging ones. But like, uh, you know, Kevin, I, I talked to Kevin Weeks about the whole situation, and and he was right too. Like, if you know, if he took the job in Chicago, or he took the job in Arizona, or he took the job in Ottawa, Toronto, they, every place you go has has its own challenges or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's only thirty-two of them, and you just you know. He, he he was you know he, no GM no got no person gets to like pick and choose which right. which GM job they want they just you take the one that gets offered to you and you do the best you can and, and it's exciting yeah. he's a former shark so he's got at least some ties to San Jose <laughs> he's not some random yeah. player that you know never played here so uh, he does have ties here and uh, he's got three children that uh, one of them is going to be playing for the junior sharks I believe his yeah. youngest son so he said his youngest son is going to yeah. be a junior shark and his oldest son learned how to skate here. Mm-hmm. Um, it was also interesting that we we were talking about those guys from the draft that Lund and Fisher both have played against Jaden Greer <laughs> in high school and their various Boston prep schools. Yeah, and um, we'll probably continue playing against them uh, in the in the future. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All I, these, so, all I, these ties and I asked yeah. I asked Mike about like you know because you know he's, whenever he goes to see his son play is he does he noticed these other like top area kids and he said well yeah you know you're not there like. Doing a full scout on yeah. this kid who's my son is playing against, but but you, I mean he's certainly You're not you, blind either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially at that level, like yeah. the, good, the good kids stand out. Yeah. You know, even you, like you and I, could pick out who the best player is on a yeah. on a Boston high school team. So yeah. absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> um, cool. Well, I think that's going to conclude the show for today. Is there anything else that you want to add? No, I'm just uh, excited for development campus this week. Yeah, and uh, I mean there are, there's just like a, there's a bunch of kids that are going to be there that I've never met or never really seen a whole lot of play mm-hmm. so that'll be interesting and then yeah the new the new barracuda arena the rookie challenge thing that, that's like people are very excited for the rookie challenge thing i like the team that i covered before well so the i covered the capitals mm-hmm. and they didn't they had a rookie camp and they just played one game against the flyers and it just <laughs> rotated back and forth between yeah. dc and philly that was boring and then the devils went to buffalo and they played a couple of games um but this is different. This is like six teams. This mm-hmm. this feels like I I feel like the the writers who don't get to cover like the Traverse City tournament or this West Coast whatever it's called. I'll learn that. Uh, <laughs> um, like uh, you always are kind of like jealous. Like oh man, all these all these teams get together. All you get to see all the good prospects from all the other teams. Yeah. So and the fact that it's at the new Sharks or the new Barracuda Arena. Right. Be, yeah, be I'm very excited for so that yeah. to open up. Yeah. yeah, we will be there. Paul and I will be there uh, probably on different days. I'm not sure which one. We're still working that out, but. Yeah. We'll probably see you there. All right. All right. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. All right. Uh, Well, thank you for joining us for episode 152. Paul will be back soon, I promise. Uh, I'm not hiding him in the trunk or anything. (laughs) And uh, thank you, and we'll see you eventually soon. All right. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com, where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.